Memory and the Tingle in Selected Essays by Philippine Lesbian Writers. When I first imagined the Tingle anthology of Binay lesbian writing, I had only the title, which had always been an inside joke among Filipinos who know that the English word tingle is a kind of homonym for the Filipino word for clitoris. It makes obvious sense for the English word that literally means the sensation of slight prickles, stings, or tremors to also bring to mind the clitoris, the only organ in the female body that is devoted purely to pleasure. As I explained in my introduction to the anthology, when I sent out the call for submissions, I asked the writers to respond to the question, what makes you tingle as a lesbian? I wanted them to define the terms and enact them on the page. And as it turned out, many of the pieces are not about sex at all, because while the body plays an important part in desire, the lesbian tingle is the flint a spark of recognition that one loves a woman as a woman. But given the limitations of an anthology introduction, I did not go into the theoretical underpinnings of such a project, which I undertook alongside my own practice-based research for my PhD. Despite charges of essentialism, I maintain that examining the way women write as women as opposed to how men write, and the relationship between gender and genre is still a rich area of study. In the now classic text of French feminism, critic Hélène Sixou affirms that while, quote, it is impossible to define a feminine practice of writing, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, close quote. She famously calls it writing the body and producing female sexed texts. In the case of Tingle, the contributors are not only female sexed, that is, possessing biologically female sex traits, but also lesbian identified, in this, which is to say that all of them gave permission to be included in an anthology labeled lesbian. In this paper, I examine the ways some of the essays write the lesbian body in the spirit of Sixu's new insurgent writing that will liberate her from history. Memory is the primary material from which these personal essays are constructed, even as they are not defined strictly as memoir. As a Filipino lesbian who expresses physically as feminine, I am never mistaken for a lesbian. I'm always assumed to be heterosexual and thus I pass inadvertently until I say I am not. While the femme to femme relationship has gained popularity among younger lesbians in the Philippines, particularly those who wish to dissociate from the traditional binary created by the traditional butch femme relationship, unless they directly identify as lesbians, femmes remain invisible as lesbians in Philippine culture. In choosing to express my female gender as feminine, I passed as a heterosexual woman in the context of the Filipino culture. I didn't deliberately perform my feminine look in order to pass. Sometimes I actually liked looking feminine, having long hair, putting on makeup, wearing dresses, because I thought that made me pretty. As a Filipino female, I am subject to our rigid gender role expectations and standards. So I've been trained and constrained to think that to be pretty, I need to look feminine. As Judith Butler suggests in her concept of gender performativity, women are constrained to repeat the acts expected of a female, even though we are aware of how some of these acts may be contributing to our oppression as females. But in 1999, I did shave off all my hair to prove a point. But even with a buzz cut, my lesbian friends teased me that I was not butch enough because I didn't know how to play basketball or billiards, skills that were typical of butches in that community in Baguio City. 
it must have been a joke because it didn't make sense to base identity on stereotypes among lesbians who claim to be Marxist feminists, members of the organization Lesbians in Baguio for National Democracy or Lesbon. Not all Filipino butches are athletic either. But even as a joke, it had an impact on how I conceived of myself as a lesbian at that time. I didn't intend to be butch, but it seemed to me that for my lesbian community to consider me as one of them, I had to prove I was butch enough because a femme lesbian cannot be trusted. She is always suspected of the potential to turn around and run away with a man. As the early sexologists who promoted their theory of, of inversion have suggested, a lesbian who doesn't present as masculine is not exactly a lesbian. And as Lisa Walker confirms, quote, her authenticity as a lesbian must be questioned, close quote. I thought my buzz cut made me ugly because in the Philippines, women's beauty is traditionally considered contingent on hair being one so-called crowning glory. Long hair is perceived as more feminine. It is loose, so societally structured form of sexual dimorphism or a trait that differentiates between the sexes. When I shaved my head following the logic of sexual dimorphism, I removed a trait that signified me as a female, thus removing me from the binary relation between male and female. What is more, a cut so close to the scalp removes a woman from the male gaze, which looks at women as sex objects. American cultural anthropologist Vern Combe explains, quote, Looking at a woman's face, at her hair, has conventionally been an exercise of desire and of an assertion of male power, close quote. In this case, my boldness showed that I was refusing to subject myself to the male radar. Ergo, I am a lesbian. Vern Combe adds that hair is seen through the Freudian lens wherein the whole head becomes a stand-in for sexuality, leading many to automatically assume that if a woman has short hair, she must be a lesbian, which is not always the case. On the other hand, for Krista Melgarejo, cutting her hair short in her late 20s when she was dis-uncovering her lesbian identity led to a greater appreciation of it, even though it was only due to having lost a bet. In her essay, Stopovers, she explains that while she didn't try to pass as a straight girl, she, quote, really enjoyed the process of shifting my gender expression close quote, which may have been part of why she didn't cut her hair prior to the dare. Short hair would have marked her definitively as butch. In a chapter entitled How to Recognize a Lesbian, Walker states, quote, the paradigm of visibility is totalizing when a signifier of difference becomes synonymous with the identity it signifies, close quote. If a lesbian could be identified visibly as a lesbian, she would have to bear the weight of the heteronormative community's mostly stereotypical ideas about lesbians as a group. Melgarejo shares that after her haircut, she was, quote, quite nervous when I went home for Christmas that year, close quote, even though she had come out to her parents two years prior. She was surprised that no one said anything about it except her great-grandmother, who didn't recognize her and demanded to know whose son she was. The family had a good laugh about it, an event memorialized by a traditional holiday family picture. By the end of the essay, Melgarejo assures us, quote, I have never felt more confident with who and what I am, close quote. Thus, by cutting off all her feminine identified hair, she herself is convinced of her authenticity as a lesbian. 
In my creative practice research, I investigate the inherent instability of identity in the Philippine lesbian, which is grounded on the lack of a Filipino term for lesbian. I posit that the prefix pagka suggests a potential space for becoming or identity construction, even as it literally means a state of being. For instance, in pagkababae, femaleness, versus pagka hyphen babae, female becoming. This concept resonates with Judith Butler's notion of forms of gendering. That is, the performativity of gender, which refers to, quote, a set of repeated acts within a highly rigid regulatory frame, close quote. For Butler, gender is not a performance one freely chooses because its iterations are constrained by the patriar patriarchal system in which we operate. But she adds that this notion of performativity makes gender open to intervention and re-signification. See, in this way, gender norms cease to be interpreted as natural or static. In the Philippine culture, which is strongly influenced by Catholicism, gender norms are not only interpreted as natural, they seem to be even more regulatory associated with morality. In this context of Catholicism or Christianity, lesbian filmmaker Cha Roque transforms the romantic act of kissing her girlfriend into an act of revolt. In her essay, Our Kisses Are Our Raised Fists, she shares how at a pride march, she kissed her girlfriend in front of a preacher who was screaming that gay sex is immoral and had a placard to boot. This act was captured on camera and published in some news features about that event, thus turning it into an iconic moment of defiance in Philippine lesbian history. While that was a triumphant scene in the safe space of a pride march, Roque shares that these kisses have also led to violence from the male audience in other instances. They've been groped and assaulted, even punched in the faces for telling a guy off. I must note that both Roque and her girlfriend express as feminine in varying degrees. While many of us may care little about people staring and judging us, we do care about our safety. Do we need to hide our love to ensure that we stay safe from attack? Sixu urges women to, quote, write through their bodies and invent the impregnable language that will wreck partitions, regulations, and codes, close quote. In finding the language to articulate our bodies and desires, we gain the strength to resist the systemic attacks on us. Roque concludes that holding hands and, and kissing are iterations of love regardless of sexual orientation and must not be hidden. She asserts that, quote, the loving gestures that I have learned to treat with secrecy and shame growing up have become an act of resistance. Not letting go of my partner's hand is an act of dissent. And that, indeed, is how we throw our bodies into our loving for our partners and for our community. In the essay, Our Bodies, Our Wellness, Jeannie Villar uses memory to put forward a political message about lesbian lives. She reveals that, quote, as a woman, lesbian, and butch, I have had a complicated relationship with my body, close quote. Looking back on her childhood, she recalls that as a girl butch, her classmates marked her as tomboy and as Nakakahawa, as if lesbianism were a contagious disease. 
she lamented that she never got chosen for group work and that she was always alone. The more I withdrew, the more I became a freak in their eyes. I suspect these are painful memories also shared by other Philippine lesbians who expressed as butch in their childhood. To be called tomboy in the Philippines is derogatory, and it is a term used only for butch lesbians, defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as lesbians whose appearance and behavior are seen as traditionally masculine. Women who have relationships with butches are usually called femme or lesbians whose appearance and behavior are seen as traditionally feminine and are also called, in the Philippines, babae or female. That they are called babae suggests that in the Philippines, the femme is not perceived as a lesbian. When Villar entered adolescence, she rejected the way her body was growing into greater femininity. She even wanted to get a mastectomy and a hysterectomy to end her suffering, which today would be called gender dysphoria. But it must be clarified that Villar does not identify as trans. She just wanted to express as masculine, which did not conform to patriarchal expectations of women. The tension arising from her butch identity transposed from the physical into the emotional once she started having relationships with women. I quote, I acted based on how I perceived myself to be butch, and butches aren't wimps, close quote. This led to her taking all the blame and abuse in a toxic relationship simply because that's what she thought a butch would do. These gender role expectations led to her dis-ease with her identity and which translated into the ways she mistreated her body. Villar posits that we must heal our relationships with our bodies and ourselves as a service to the larger lesbian community to prevent further brokenness. She uses the concept of wellness as both a personal and political challenge. I believe that as lesbian writers, this wellness arises from being able to write ourselves in the way that Siksu urges. I quote, woman must put herself into the text as into the world and into history by her own movement, close quote. That is, by how our bodies move in our writing. All three writers have taken the challenge literally using their lesbian bodies in time as subject in their essays. On the other hand, I explore my own pagka lesbiana through how I write. While the spirit of Siksu permeates all my writing as a woman, the theoretical work of Quebecois critic Nicole Brazard has captured my imagination as a lesbian. Briefly, for Brazard, desire and pleasure are a point of departure in lesbian writing. They emanate from a woman writer's lesbian body, which desires another woman and lies somehow outside the patriarchy in her rejection of the male. Brazard gives me a theoretical anchor for my choice to identify as a lesbian writer and my efforts to inscribe and embody this desire. Without going into too much detail here, my physical experimentation with Pagka Butch through dressing up dressing up in stereotypically butch clothes and gestures led to my discovery of a new way to embody my pagka lesbiana in my writing. The attitude of play based on dress up rooted in the concept of cross-dressing allowed me to explore and stretch the essay form. This strategy is evident in my essay, Directions for My Care, which I include in Tingle. In it, I try to pass an essay off as a legal document or pass a legal document off as an essay, as the case may be, 
drawing attention to the way it performs itself as essay becoming. In this piece, I juxtapose the actual text of my directions for my care and in the event of my death document with memory-centered sections riffing off certain key stipulations in the legal document. It was inspired by a workshop I had attended on LGBT families and the Philippine legal framework, which aimed to show how we could work with and around the current laws to protect our families. At at present, the Philippines does not have any laws protecting LGBT individuals, much less their families. Our family code still defines marriage as between a man and a woman, and we do not have a divorce law. The law on succession stipulates absolute community of property. So when I die, for instance, half of everything that I own goes to my husband including my inheritance. Only 25% remains free for me to assign to my lesbian partner or anyone else if I wanted to. It was a sobering day that made me feel the urgency of writing my directions for my care and in the event of my death document. Unlike the hermit crab essay, if the memoir sections are removed in this piece, the document can still serve its legal function. I do not appropriate the legal document only as a container for the real material of the piece. When playing dress up, the borrowed dress retains its integrity. I know this piece would not pass the standards of the creative nonfiction police for true stories well told, but this is the future direction in which I want to take my writing, away from the more conventional modes of the essay, which I associate with male sexed texts. In conclusion, whether a lesbian writes her body as content or as form, I echo Elensic Seuss's pronouncement that, quote, a feminine text cannot fail to be more than subversive. It is volcanic. There's no other way. Close quote. And now that it has erupted, there is simply no stopping the tingle. Thank you very much.